for a time at least, for the strident Pan-Africanist calls were not directed, in my view, at Africa's historical exploiters, but at the predilection for Africa to surrender her pride and value in the form of oppressive and hegemonic relations. I suggest that NEPAD was an early collaborative endeavor that reflected this new thinking, a pledge, as the NEPAD Declaration puts it, I quote, by African leaders based on a common vision and a firm and shared conviction that they have a pressing duty to eradicate poverty and to place their countries, both individually and collectively, on a path for sustainable growth and development, and at the same time, to participate actively in the world economy and body politic." Unquote. One guess is that we sensed at this point that the Afghan Renaissance ideal had become real and concrete and material. And this raised the hopes of the critical intellectual community in Africa and abroad. By this initiative, I suppose, one could observe that African intellectual leadership was able to partner with and recognize the intellectual resources that Africa was capable of and to manage those collectively for the greater good. This was a constructivist idea on the phenomenon of globalization that was then prevalent and to manage it for Africa's benefit. Tade Akin Aina, in the introduction to the book, he co-edited with Saithi El Shashaj and Elizabeth Anna Yao, Globalization and Social Policy in Africa, published by Kotesri. Observe that with the malaise of the years of Africa in doldrums and a prolonged state of crisis had been, and I quote, not only the delegitimization and undermining of the African state and the erosion of its capacity to provide basic and other forms of services, but also the emergence of a form of social consciousness that denies the validity and relevance of both social policy in the development processes and the development process itself as a key element of social transformation." Unquote. In this, of course, Aina refers to some of the World Bank positivist economics of development in Africa that stunted development and social change to a considerable extent. More seriously, behind this, he is bemoaning the extent to which Africa outsourced responsibility for her own development. NEPAD sought to reverse this. But the development process to be transformative has to be owned by Africans and serve the needs of the most needy of Africa's peoples. Hence, Amartya Sen refers to this challenging, holistic and transformatory development as the ideal that benefits the livelihoods of the people. And he says, and I quote, eliminate poverty and advance emancipation from domination, social economic injustice inequality, and inequality. Sen's notion of development is both freedom and the exercise of free choice by the beneficiaries in the development cycle. NEPAD recognized through the African peer review mechanism that development must go hand in hand with human freedoms and capacity, as well as the accountability of states. We have every reason, therefore, to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the African Union. That is because, in large measure, the Afri Africa has proved skeptics wrong. Wrong about the determination of Africa to take charge of her own affairs and to sustain mutually accountable democracy and human rights, however imperfect, and to drive her own development agenda and set in place mechanisms for the management of conflicts. For good reason, therefore, does one apply Aina's conclusion that, and I quote, the struggle for good governance and basic rights and the establishment of sustainable and relevant economic development strategies that include frameworks geared towards building and rebuilding institutions, recovering people's self-confidence, and renewing social integration and social justice have been the focus of attention of the African Union since its establishment. Mafeja, therefore, was wholly correct to say that the cycle of African intellectual and historical activity is but brief spans of time. To put it mildly, we are perhaps experiencing a lull 
in these matters in Africa today. It is hard to understand how it was that in Cote d'Ivoire and now Guinea-Bissau in Mali, Africa appears to have surrendered initiatives to France and other international bodies to maintain her claim to colonial cultural and political confidence on Africa. It is conceivable that failure by Africa to take collective decisive action in Cote d'Ivoire fueled and encouraged adventurism by the military men. <laughs> Madagascar, Guinea-Bissau, Mali, Niger. It may well be true also that the rumbling Arab Spring developed to the extent it did and with the consequences that followed, precisely because after years of misrule and kleptocratic states, there was no confidence that any of the African processes would ever bring relief or meaningful change. I suspect that we would have been in a similar situation in Zimbabwe and Kenya had not timely interventions materialized. Whether that is to be regretted or not is debatable. The lesson, it seems to me, is that Africa must listen to the voices of the people of Africa and deem it necessary to take active steps within the provisions of the Constitutive Act of the African Union and the mechanisms of the Peace and Security Council of the African Union. To conclude, I come back to the notion I introduced from Plato at the start of this address. It is that leaders should be men and women of reason who are qualified and capable of holding their own in world affairs and be trusted and trustworthy in their dealings with people and resources. <laughs> there is likely to be a tendency from leaders who are without intellect to also lack in moral fiber. <laughs> because they fail to understand the limitations of governance, but also that they may be incapable of drawing from their own capabilities to provide the nation with a new compelling and confident vision of itself and of their idealism to bear times above the fray and help guide the nation in its most difficult moments. I had just left Mumbai in India the day in 2008 when the terrorist attack took place. I must say that it still sounds very strange for me to, 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 to say that word for some reason. I always try to find another word for it, but that's what it was called. I watched from our hotel room in Hyderabad, the Halta Skelta Manor, in which the aftermath of the attack was handled. Clearly failure of intelligence, lack of readiness by security forces, and some indifference and even cynicism. These things happen, said one official, about the consequences of inaction or prevaricating when Rome was literally burning. This got many Indian people very angry. Yes, angry against the terrorists, but increasingly volubly angry against their own government. I read a few late days later in the International Herald Tribune a feature article analyzing the effect of the attack on the psyche of the people of Mumbai. It was suggested that in India for far too long, the educated elite and the intellectuals had shied away from active taking an active part in politics and considered it not to be worthy of their consideration either because politicians were those who had been failures in society or were undereducated lower classes. <laughs> and, so, and so prestige for them went into business, the arts including films, and of course indulging in lifestyles of affluence and speculative theorizing about this and that. The, the report suggested that Mumbai was a wake-up call. Indifference was no longer cool because indifference had meant death. It said that the educated, intellectual, and elite classes could no longer outsource politics to the mediocre and the incompetence without consequence. <laughs> and, as such, and as such says Anand Giri Daradas in this feature article, galvanized by attacks, the apathetic elite rise up. There was a sudden allure and sentimentalism about the good old days of the failed idea that India be run by its brightest and not its dullest bombs. 
<laughs> Emmanuel Tripudi Eze, in his book, Memory, Reason, and Politics, says, the defense of reason and its justice will be valid, even when it is acknowledged that modernity's industrial and commercial reason is merely an imperfect version of possible historical ideals. In fact, this potential in the capacity to conceive such better reasons accounts for the necessity for such historical critique of reasons of the present. Far from dogmatic or conservative, this is a critical progressive theory of rationality. He argues that this remains true even in cases where men and women of reason fail to exercise their faculties of reason or to become dogmatic and resort to tyranny. It is not because of reason that they so behave, but because they shall have abandoned reason. I do not accept the stereotype that reason is heartless or that rationality is without feeling, without soul. On this understanding, there can be no reason without soul, because the soul does not dance and float about, detached from the mind. The worst situation I display to though is when a ruler devoid of a philosophical mind of decency in judgment and arbitrary and irrational in the exercise of power, but relies solely on self-interest to justify his actions. And I quote, often he will take to politics, leap to his feet and do or say whatever comes to his head, or he conceives, or he conceives an admiration and his interests are in war, or for a man of business, and straight away, that is his line. He knows no order or necessity in life, but he calls life as he conceives it. Pleasant and free and divinely blessed, and is ever faithful to it." Unquote. I plead, therefore, that Africa may never abandon her appreciation and understanding of quality in leadership. Strive for nothing short of excellence rather than mediocrity, and for visionary and ethical leaders. It is perhaps going too far to suggest that we are in a quagmire because we have managed to substitute reason and people consciousness for self-interest, public service for personal aggrandizement, ethics for absence of integrity and opportunism, honest dealing in public life and being trustworthy for corruption and entrenched and get rich quick culture. And yet, we, the people, only wish to be governed fairly and justly. We wish to have conditions created for self-development, and we aspire to be no more than fully human with rights and dignity that we owe to no one. And above all, we strive simply to be African, and to proudly shout, I am an African, with President Thabo Mbeki. Thank you.